All right, let's get this on the road. This is our signature panel, and we are really excited to be with you all. And I just, I love the energy and the chatter, and you know, I hate to bring that to just a moment, but the best way I can start off this panel is something that Dory Lynn, where are you? We just did it in the last session, stand up. She is infamous for getting people like feeling like they know everybody and a master networker, but she always starts off any session before we get into the meat of it with who they are and their dorm and their favorite thing from their Tulane or Newcomb days. So Christy, I'm gonna have you start and just share who you are, your title, and then we'll get back into your stories and all those good things. Wonderful, well it's great to be here. Thank you so much. I'm Christy Bloomquist. I was Christy Edwards when I was at uh, Newcomb back in the day and I am currently Vice President U.S. Corporate and Government Affairs at AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca is a research-based pharmaceutical company. Um, I lived freshman year in JL, uh, which um, takes me way back uh, when it was still all, all women. And uh, my favorite thing to do there, I'm looking at people outside on this gorgeous day, and I loved being able to hang out on the JL beach and, and get some sun back in the day. So so that was that was definitely something that um, came to mind today. So thank and, you. And a lot out there could relate to those. <laughs> Say it next. Hello, thank you all for having me. My name is Thea Williams. 20 years ago, I was Thea Johnson. I was a student at the uh, School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. I finished here in 97. Um, my favorite thing to do, or my, eat. <laughs> I am a Louisiana girl born and bred, and so I love everything Southeast Louisiana. I. Most people in D.C. call me a Louisiana smuggler. I, I'm the girl that you see on the ice chest with an ice chest on the airport and a bag of rice on my back. <laughs> so uh, I love everything Louisiana. When I was here at Tulane, I lived at Rosen Hall. Uh, it's no longer there. I don't think it's there on uh, Claiborne Avenue. Uh, I am currently uh, the deputy director of legislative affairs at the White House at the executive office of the president for the office of science and technology policy. Awesome. awesome, more to come there. All right, Alanda. Uh, good afternoon, ladies, and so happy to be back on Tulane's campus. It's been a while. Uh, my name is Alanda Dobbins. I'm the CEO and president of Otika Technologies in Memphis, Tennessee, which is where I'm from. Uh, my name was Alanda Dobbins then, it's Alanda Dobbins now, <laughs> never changed it. Uh, and um, we stayed in the stadium uh, apartments, they were brand new when we stayed in them. That was the last dorm I was in on campus. My favorite thing was flag football, <laughs> believe it or not. So we had the most amazing flag football team that had been at Tulane in years, right? <laughs> and so we ended up going to championship uh, um, in, um, what was it? Oh, we, we had right. to drive six hours to go to the championship. Everybody talked about Tulane like, oh, psh, Tulane doesn't have a girls flag football team. What are we talking about, right? And as soon as somebody said something like that, me, my roommate, Terry, one of us broke out and had a foot uh, touchdown. So that's my favorite time here at Tulane, <laughs> that touchdown when they didn't believe in us. Don't tell Alanda she can't do something, right? <laughs> and again, I'm Deanne Golden. I was Deanne Blanton um, when I was here, 88 to 92, graduated from Newcomb. And um, now I live in Atlanta and the president and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Georgia Properties, and about 1,500 agents. Um, and when I was here, you know, I absolutely loved to swim. If you know much about my story at all, I swam here at Tulane. And if I wasn't doing that, I'd love to be over in Audubon Park, uh, taking a walk and just any kind of New Orleans food. And so I'm gonna take your tips on how to <laughs> smuggle some back home when I go back. But um, now this is, and again, Doyleen, thank you. That is a great icebreaker. So when you're back home in your clubs and networking, do that. And it's a great way to build connections. But as you could quickly tell, we have a very, very successful and esteemed panel here today, and I'm honored to moderate. So I'm gonna start back and just kind of go down the line. And I'll start with Christy and we're gonna open up and just have them take a couple of minutes and really tell you their story. Um, just kind of high level. And then we're gonna dive into some really great, great specific questions. And we'll start with you, Christy. So tell us a little bit from Tulane to here. 
great. So I thought it would actually, I'll go in reverse. Okay. Um, so my current role leading corporate and government affairs at AstraZeneca, so that is a role where obviously we're doing government affairs work as the title implies, federal, state, and policy. Uh, we also manage all the patient group relationships, so we work quite a bit with patient advocacy groups in our disease areas, which range from oncology to rare disease to respiratory to cardiovascular, kind of cover everything. So our group manages those relationships. And then I'm also responsible for internal and external communications in the U.S. for the company. AstraZeneca itself has about 80,000 employees, so we have about 15,000 in the U.S. So big company, uh, you may have heard of us from the pandemic. Uh, we actually had a vaccine that wasn't used in the U.S. as well as some other COVID therapeutics. So that's the current job. If you had told me that would be my job when I was here and graduating, I would have like looked at you like, what are you talking about? Because in my head, my plan was to be a hospital administrator. And I had really set my path towards doing that. I was headed off to grad school at Wash U in St. Louis. And I was gonna pick up a law degree along the way because I thought a joint degree sounded like a good idea. And so that was the plan. And that is what I did. I went to Wash U and I graduated with a joint degree, but instead of becoming a hospital administrator, I ended up going into the law firm side and, and I worked in a big firm in Chicago for a number of years and uh, still stayed in the healthcare space. Uh, my dad was a doctor. We always talked about healthcare growing up and so that has been a consistent theme. Uh, and so practiced healthcare regulatory law in Chicago and then Washington DC where I moved to the East Coast to be closer to my family and, and really rose through the ranks from a law firm perspective uh, and reached a um, you know, partner and um, really could see what my career looked like as I continued on. I could still be doing this for the next 15 or 20 years. Uh, and it was a little bit out of the blue that I got an email from someone who said, I don't know you, I've heard about you, which could be good or bad. <laughs> so, um, but, um, you know, AstraZeneca is a client, um, and even though we haven't worked together, we really need somebody who will become a lobbyist for the company and lobby on the Affordable Care Act. Could we grab a cup of coffee? And so I was like, sure, you know, I, and I think that would be some of my career advice never say no to the cup of coffee, you never know where it'll go. And so, um, I had the cup of coffee and we had a conversation that I'd never lobbied before. And he's like, that's okay. You understand how healthcare works and that's what we need. That's the skill set. So we'll teach you what you need to know to be a successful lobbyist. Um, but would you consider coming over? And so that was in 2008, right before President Obama was elected and had the opportunity to go to AZ and lobby on the ACA. Um, and spent a good three or four years being a lobbyist. And so that was a really different experience. Some of the same skill sets and how you work with telling your story, being clear about your advocacy objectives were roughly translatable from law firm life, but it was a big career pivot for me. Um, and then since that time, I've had the opportunity to have lots of different careers within a career at AZ and so, uh, led our policy function, led our Washington office, uh, and then had the opportunity to take on corporate affairs about five years ago. And that's where I've been uh, ever since. And, you know, lots of stories during that time. I talked about COVID. That was a really interesting time, especially as we were all working from home. And once we announced our vaccine partnership, um, talked to our CEO and arranged for him to talk to the U.S. government the next day. Um, and I think that will probably be a standout memory for me, having the government say, you know, we will put the full resource and weight of the U.S. government behind you to accelerate a, a vaccine. And so, um, so those are, you know, some of the, the sparkly moments. There have been lots of not so sparkly moments. <laughs> uh, we, I'm sure we'll talk about it, but that is uh, basically who I am and where I came from. So thank you, Christy. And, you know, I just want to highlight one thing. Did you hear what she said? That coming out of out of Tulane, she was focused on getting a master's in in hospital administration. I remember that, Christy, and I remember thinking that that was so incredible that you had that vision. And then what's happened along the way? Every door that's opened, she's followed it, and it took her into a similar but different path and been incredibly successful. And thank you for all you do. All right, there.
So I'm going to start from the beginning. My granddad died in, when I was a sophomore in college. Um, so I always wanted to be a doctor. And so I wanted to help him. And I'm not going to cry. So I wanted to help. And so I wanted to be a physician. So I went to Xavier. Uh, I'm an uptown girl. Um, I went to Xavier. These are the only two schools I ever wanted to go to in my entire life, Xavier and Tulane. That's all I saw was Xavier and Tulane. So I did do my undergrad at Xavier. I was biology, a biology pre-med. But, and then during the summertime, I would be here at Tulane at the medical school in the pre-med program. The year I was there, I, uh, I actually made a perfect score on the written portion of the exam. Wow. So uh, the dean at Xavier asked me to change my major from, um, from uh, biology, pre-med, to English. Uh, they allowed me to continue to take my science courses so that if I wanted to go to medical school, I had all the backings that I need to, but they had never saw anyone that had the ability to understand science and articulate it in a plain way for others to, uh, to be able to interpret and read. Uh, with that, I then matriculated here to Tulane to the School of Public Health because I still wasn't sure I wanted to be a physician. And so I wandered a little bit, and I was just talking to my dad about someone that he met at uh, this conference called PitCon. My father uh, worked for Monsanto. And he, uh, so they brought me there, and I kind of got to industrial hygiene a little bit. I was like, mm, I don't know about that. And then I fell in love with environmental science, and I ended up getting a degree here um, in environmental science uh, from Tulane. I, after leaving Tulane, I went to the state of Louisiana where I worked uh, with hazardous and, um, and solid waste management, which gets me back to what I end up, ended up doing. I did end up helping people who suffer from cancer. My grandfather died of lymphoma. And sometimes you look at um, how did you get here? Well, he was a mechanic and he was also a carpenter. And so he would wash his hand in gasoline a solvent, which was a direct relation uh, to developing cancer. So what I uh, ended up doing, I do risk analysis. I started at some point in my career doing risk analysis on protecting the majority of populations, the, the tail ends of the bell curve, as we call them, the sensitive population, children and older people. So that prote protects everybody like me. Most people here are in the bell. So when you protect the tails of the curve, you protect the people in the center. So I did the science that made regulations legal and made them stick, so to say, that they could not be overturned uh, in a court of law. I then took a little stint uh, recently of getting a law degree, and um, I'm currently at the White House championing um, the Biden-Harris Biden administration's um, legislative, legislative agenda for climate change, energy, and health and science. Wow. Wow. I'm just getting to know Thea, but I can go right there and say this. I know your parents and your grandpapa are mighty <laughs> proud of all that you are accomplishing every day. Yes. <laughs> All right, Alanda, please okay, tell us your ladies, story. Listen, you know, I didn't save the world from cancer <laughs> and the full weight and backing of the government behind me when I speak, right? Uh, but uh, when I came to New Orleans on a visiting trip to see which school I was going to, I hate to say it, Mom, but at that time, you could drink at 16 in Louisiana. <laughs> And I said, that's the school I want to go to, right? <laughs> Tulane University. So I uh, came here, met some of the most amazing friends that I've ever had. That's uh, Fela, who's my roommate. She's sitting at the front, who is native uh, uh, from Alabama, but um, lives here. Been here. So she's, I, I can say native in many ways. Her family's here. Uh, and uh, finished here and said I wanted to travel the world a little bit. So I went to Delta Airlines and became a flight attendant. Um, moved to Atlanta, did that for a season. Uh, got married, had child number one. Uh, and when I was pregnant with child number two, 
that marriage did not work. So I moved back home. Moved back home, my father was a serial entrepreneur. My mother, who's also here right now, a teacher of 50 years. And so I gotta just stop and say, look, let me give you a round of applause. <laughs> Um, she was amazing as a teacher. We all, every year we had to help her with her students. Uh, and so still learned a lot from that. Um, moved home. My dad, being a serial entrepreneur, was starting his successful business number three. And when I got home, of course, that was traumatic uh, and life-changing, life-altering. And he said, you know what? You love business. You've been around it all your life. Why don't you look at doing this business with me? And I was like, eh, I don't know, Dad. I don't know about that. Uh, but so thankful that I did. Um, that business was an Avaya business partner. We were one of two African-American Avaya business partners in the country at the time. And I learned so much. So I would say my second degree was learning from the George Dobbins School of Entrepreneurship, my father. Uh, and uh, learned how to, he was um, trained as one of the first African Americans in the 3M system when um, they taught from Dale Carnegie and all the Zig Ziglar top sales courses. And so that's how I got trained from him. Didn't know he was training me, to be quite honest. Didn't realize that until later in life. Um, my father passed rather suddenly um, and we, our company at that time was 12 years old. And I just couldn't do it. I mean, I was too emotionally, um, you know, distraught to continue. So I sold everything off, walked away, ended up working for our previous mayor um, with a program which is near and dear to my heart uh, called MORE. We helped grow minority women-owned businesses. And um, one of the most rewarding things to do is to help um, the underdog. Uh, and in many ways, particularly some 11 years ago, uh, women were the underdog. We still are in some ways, but we're making strides. Um, and so I did that program for four years under that. And then when he was not elected again, I, I said, you know what, go back to your passion. You know, your second, your other passion, which is starting your own business. So I took that leap, uh, took all of my savings, all of my resources and started a business. Um, we're seven years old in March. We passed that five-year mark, uh, and we do cabling, low-voltage cabling, which was an arm of our company when my dad was alive. It's something where you have to have cable for your um, computers, your telephones, um, any of your access control. That's what we do. We, my daughter, who is here with uh, me today, is the vice president, and we tell everybody we are high-voltage women doing low-voltage cabling. <laughs> And so that brings us to today. Uh, we currently, you know, never missed a payroll, which I'm very proud of doing this without my father this time. It was daunting. I had everybody praying for me. Um, but um, we've never missed a payroll. We're up to 40, and we just won a contract. We're going to be up to 60 employees uh, in the next week or so. Wow, that's congratulations. <laughs> And proud family right here. And, you know, it's interesting. I'm a big Zig Ziglar fan. Um, your dad's taught you well. It's not how hard you fall. It's how high you bounce. And you are bouncing so high. And I just, I love that. You know, each of you referenced um, a family member that's been a mentor or someone inspiring you. So I'm going to kind of switch up our first question. And, and outside of a family member, you know, has there been someone significant that's impacted your career as a mentor or role model or maybe just even an invisible counselor, thinking very rich, Napoleon Hill? Um, and, and why? What would make you, you select that person? Christy, I'll start with you. I've been really fortunate to have a couple of mentors along the way, and usually my mentors have been men. Uh, I think part of it is the, the field that I've been in. Um, but from a mentorship perspective, um, usually it's a relationship that forms because you know and trust and respect the person who you're asking for advice from. So I think you've got to have a certain amount of chemistry there and trust, and then make sure that you have enough of a safe space to get the meaningful feedback. So when I was in the law firm world, my first mentor uh, was super tough on me. And, um, you know, I remember writing a memo that I'd worked on uh, quite a bit as a first year associate. And I went by and I was like, hey, you know, what'd you think of that memo? How'd it go? He's like, um, oh, your memo. Uh, let, me, let me see where I put that. And he had 
crumpled it up and it was sitting in the garbage can. And that was just like a little crushing <laughs> at the time. But we got past that and that's when I really learned so much from him about just the ins and outs of being an attorney in, in big law. Um, and then as I thought about, you know, my, my current situation, um, my mentors at AstraZeneca are people who have gone before me and they look out for me. And I think another important piece of this is there's a difference between mentorship and sponsorship. And we spent a bit of time talking about that at a meeting I was at a couple of weeks ago. So it's top of mind. So a mentorship, where do you have the relationship, somebody who you can share your career plans with, what does the journey look like? You can really bounce ideas off, but you also need sponsors. And so who's gonna t speak up for you when you're not in the room? Who's gonna represent that you're awesome and they know your capabilities and you're capable or ready for the job? And so I think not only is it important that we think about the mentors and those that influence, but again, like, how are you cultivating your sponsors? Who are they? What do they look like? And are they able to really represent the true you when it gets to that situation? So just, just offering both. I like that. Great perspective. Thea? So my biggest, probably most impactful uh, mentor was probably my kindergarten teacher. I think she taught me how to be a lifelong learner, mm. which I think embodies everything that I am, that everything that I do, that there's an ability to just be an open sponge to learn as much as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. However, um, I also had a lot of male uh, mentors. I'm a girly girl, and I don't have a very, very heavy voice. And sometimes men, and this is nothing against men, sometimes men are like in the sandbox. And I could never find my voice. And one of the most impactful things he did for me uh, when I was in Washington, D.C., and Washington, D.C. can be a rough place sometimes. Um, he, he showed me how to be a man in a dress at the table, to learn to box off, to claim your space to be able to speak um, with confidence, to be able to speak with authority without losing my Southern draw, without <laughs> losing my thanks and my please to get the things that I need to be done. And when I mean box off, he really showed me how to box off at the table. And I always liken it to playing basketball. Basketball to me is a linear sport and I never played it. But if you are a linear person, you always have to box off. And so he taught me actually how to box off at the table. So. That's impactful because when you break down communication, what is the saying? 7% is the words, 38 is the tonality, and the balance, the largest part, the 55, 57% is the interpersonal. I'm going to take that as a note. That's a great <laughs> one to write down. Thank you for sharing that a lot. Alondas, how about you? Well, I'm going to answer it in two ways. Um, one of the greatest mentors in Memphis that I have. Her name is Beverly Robertson. She is the woman that ran the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis and brought it to prominence um, and made it a worldwide museum. But two things she did, she's the one that encouraged me to start that agency within the government more, which helped grow uh, our numbers in Memphis from, at the time, a measly 3% to we reached high in the 20% uh, percent for doing business with minority women on businesses under the time that I was there. So she was very instrumental in getting me in that position. She also was instrumental. She was our first female chair of our chamber, um, and that just happened six or seven years ago. It's amazing that that had taken so long, but she put me on the chairman's circle, and that is a group of um, powerful leaders in the community, 50, that helped to shape the economics of our community. And you have to pay $50,000 a year to be a part of it. And she made sure, and you have to be, you have to go through all of these things. She made sure that I was there uh, so that my voice could be heard. The other way I'm gonna answer that is my mentor has been those who thought that I could not in life, mm -hmm. who pat you on the head, who take you for granted, who don't take your words seriously, that has been a huge mentor for me because what it has done is shaped me. You go back home, you look yourself in the mirror, and you figure it out. 
And, uh, you know, that is critical to have people around you when people treat you like that in the world who come behind and believe in you and tell you what you can do and how high you can do it is so critical. And so I learned about that mentorship by them telling me no and what I couldn't do. Finding those people in your life, it, it made me go there to find those people who really believe in you because you need that in this world. This life is not always easy. So you gotta surround yourself with people who at the end of the day, it could be your worst day, but they believe in you to no end. And so that allowed, that's a mentorship I think for me, finding those people that, did, that said, no, you can't, you're a woman, you can't do this, and then proving them wrong. So I would answer it that way. I love that. And you know, while you're here today, Think of who was that person in your world that either really helped rise you up or maybe to your point, Alanda said, no, you can't. And then you just said, watch me, I'll show you. But reach out to them. Have you ever told them thank you? Have you ever said you have no idea the impact you've made on my life? The power of that will come back exponentially. And as one of my greatest female mentors always said, she felt she was there leading with a velvet glove to rise us up, but we were charged it was never ever getting to the top because we were constantly having to try to rise others up around us and find out who will be those people that will one day be reaching back to you and, and saying, thank you, you helped get me here. So next question, um, you know, we've already talked a good bit because you're just seeing it in their innate character, but when you think about important characteristics as leaders, you know, what would be maybe the number one in today's world where you're at in your career and, and why? And um, I'll start I'll start actually here. We'll throw it back down. Alana, so I'll go reverse order. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, everybody talks about uh, vision and tenacity um, and uh, you, 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 all those words, you look up leader. Um, you know, but one thing, you, compassion is a huge part of it. One thing I love about starting our company is we, you know, they say you have to be a man to run it, but do it with uh, softness. I don't know, you know, we create an environment, we hire second chance citizens. So I, you know, the nurturing that comes from that, ch that second chance, um, I think as a woman starting a business, we um, make sure that we hire people who, when they're at other companies, don't have a shot, mm -hmm. right? And we allow them to change their lives by having a shot at our company. Uh, and we institute those kinds of things. We are okay with the um, leaves that happen uh, when you're having uh, um, babies or uh, if you're the husband. We're okay with that because we're a woman on and we make um, changes for that. Uh, so I say you want to add compassion into leadership. Uh, in addition to those standard things that you look up, um, the vision. And, and there's a gut feel when you are around a leader that is a great leader and you know that they're going to lead you in the right way. So um, the emotional intelligence. Uh, so I will add those words to being a great leader as well. That's great. Thank you. Thea? I'm going to just jump out in it. I didn't want to say that I think his servant leadership is the best. In my purview, it's always leading, not as I say lead, but lead as I do. Um, I was also reminiscing about my time here at Tulane when I didn't do so well. Mm -hmm. And I felt like it was a failure. But it was the professors here at Tulane that said, no, I know what you came from. I know what they taught you over at Xavier. So I know that you can do this. And they got there and they helped me to understand concepts that I did not uh, initially, it, it just seems to be strange to me. And so as a servant leader, I think helping others gives you a sense of satisfaction in yourself. For a long time, I used to think, oh, I just want to be this, this, uh, I just want to be just so great. The greatness is in your everyday living. That's right. And it's your satisfaction in being who you are and knowing who you are and being able to have that empathy and being able to show, uh, show this to other people, people less fortunate, people more fortunate, just people. Yes. Mm -hmm. so. yes. 
beautiful. I've been reading a great book, Heart Led Leadership, and it speaks just to what you're saying. That's a great book read if you're looking for a great book takeaway from today and to enrich the lives of others. It's what we're all here for in the way you do it. It may be in one of a multitude of career paths, right? Christy, take yours. So I, I think for me, from a leadership perspective, it is recognizing your job as a leader is to lead people and not to lead projects. And that was a hard one lesson for me. I spent the first part of my career being very project focused and how do you drive to success on a project? And I would have told you like, yeah, you need people along the way, but it wasn't kind of the central focus. And it was actually when I was working on a pretty intense project and um, we got through the project, it was a success, but um, I was fortunate to have somebody on the team pull me aside and really give me some directed feedback and say, you know, the way you landed on us when you were driving that project was really hard and you were hard to work with and it was difficult and um, you know, it was, it was feedback I needed, it was honest, so I appreciated the trust to be able to share that with me. And then it's led me down a journey to think about how do I show up and is it about leading a project or is it about leading and inspiring the team and the people around me. And so really shifting that focus over the past few years to think much more about how do you lead and inspire others. And if you do that, the projects will follow. But I think especially for um, women earlier in career, that can be like it's about delivering the project and working in a law firm setting for sure it was about delivering the project in front of me less about the people and so I think you know what I try to do every day is remember it's all about the people that's the number one piece and and I know that you know left to my own devices sometimes I could revert back to being project focused so I have to remind myself of that and then I think about where I've gotten the most you know great parts from the work environment and, and it is around the people in the relationship piece. So I think it's servant leadership, it's how you show up, it's helping others, but it's just keeping that as, you know, that's that's the thing that, that you, the, your, your most important job as a leader. Christy, that was really good. And that actually segues beautifully into the next question I wanted to ask, which, you know, and I'll just throw it up to whoever would like to comment. But if, if you were giving advice to someone who is moving to their very first leadership position, you know, for the first time, or maybe it's in a different role or maybe in a different space, you know, what advice would you give them? Chris, you just said it so well. You know, stay focused on the people, not just the projects. Make that your priority. Uh, but there, Arlandis, what would you comment to that? I'll start. Yeah. Um, you know, something I would share with my younger self, you have to have the most intense belief, the most radical belief in yourself that you love yourself right now, the way you are. You don't have to do something extra. You don't have to love yourself intensely right now. It has taken me quite a few years to work on that. I'm not completely there. I'm not going to pretend that I am. But I am working on that. And so I would say to my younger self, believe in and love yourself the very most right now. Self-worth and self-love are critical to anything that you want to do in your life. So at 19, at 20, 25, and now at 55, believe in yourself. Excellent. Bear, anything else to that one? I probably would add listening. Great one. Great. Uh, a lot of times we're so headstrong that we know these things. We know where, we know the map. We know the map to the graveyard. We know where everything is buried. We know who put it there. I mean, but a lot of times I think is sometimes you just need to listen, listen. And I, and I know I can be a little theatrical a little bit about my graveyard thing, but we all know where the bodies are buried. So I, I just think sometimes if you listen, you listen to others, because to be honest with you, it is all about people. It is, I mean, as we move into a more digital age, it's still people, and people have lives, we have lives, the people above you have lives, the people above, below you have lives. I walk into the White House every, just about every day, and the honest of the White House is the honest of the White House. I cried when I first walked there, but I cried when I, uh, when I first pulled into D.C. the first time by myself, because the building is, it's America's best, yes. and, it, and that's the way it makes you feel. And Secret Service saw me and they said, the same feeling you have today is the same feeling that you will have every day that you come here. And it is the same feeling that I have all the time. 
but I make it a point to speak to the janitors. Mm -hmm. I make it a point to speak to the political leadership, the people that you see on TV. Mm -hmm. I make it a point to hug the chief of staff, to hug the um, press secretary. I just make it a point because it's the relationships that you build throughout your life that actually brings value to your life. And she said she had a quiet voice, right? <laughs> She's got that sonar hearing, and it's taking you to new heights and leading with heart. That's beautiful. I love that. Okay, so next question. I'm going to keep us moving along. And actually, I'm going to toss this one to Alondis because you're president of a company, mm -hmm. and you're, you're at a place now where sometimes they'll always say the adage, you know, it's lonely at the top, right? Mm -hmm. So what are you doing to continue to grow and develop as a leader, or maybe what are some of the programs that you know you're reaching out to? Other than being here, is this not one of the best leadership development programs you've ever been to? It is the best, Lady Beth Curry. But <laughs> what what are you doing to ensure that you're constantly growing as a leader? So yes, constantly. Uh, my work, my drive to work is about 30 minutes. So podcast. I'm almost. I don't like people calling me on my 30 minute. They do it all the time. But that's my time to listen to whatever I need to to learn, uh, whether it's subject matter or whether it's spiritual or whether it's um, sometimes you need to laugh. I mean, because the days get stressful. So um, that's, I, I highly recommend that. Um, and I'm learning how to have some work-life balance. Uh, so I get massages um, quite a, f a bit right? And so, you know, that's an odd way to answer that. But if you are uptight as a leader, we mentioned that mm -hmm. earlier, uh, you're not able to see as clearly. So I want to incorporate that as something that we should do. Self-nurturing uh, it helps you be a better leader. So, uh, and then you, um, I, I, I do things, I, I just left a Deepak Chopra retreat, right? Where they taught uh, different leadership skills. Um, and um, I'll give a shout out to Webink, which is uh, Fela's over Webink South, which is five states. And that is a great place to learn leadership for women. Uh, I was past president of NABO, National Association of Women Business Owners. Mm -hmm. They have a tripartite leadership, the existing president, the incoming president, and the past president do lunches every week and you are able to learn. So there are different things that are empowering for women. I'm in a male-dominated field. Um, many times I'm the only woman, only African-American in the room. So you have to surround yourself with very supportive um, ideals and um, uh, people. Uh, and I'll listen to uh, Rossi laugh sometimes, but if she walk in my office, my daughter, I'll be listening to some music and maybe doing some type of you know, dancing to get yourself pumped up. So all those things help you be a better leader, I think. Um, and, um, you know, I highly recommend, um, uh, the, the podcast on your daily drive. Um, just listen to Michelle Obama's, um, uh, most recent podcast, uh, and she has some of the most amazing advice as well. So thank you for sharing that. And you're right. If you don't take care of yourself, you cannot take care of, anybody of others at all. I've been listening to a lot of, um, the Sheryl Sandberg podcast mm -hmm. and, and all of her audibles. Um, she's COO of Facebook and just a tremendous wrote Lean In and Option B and just some incredible books. So um, anyone else have like a favorite podcast or a book or a comment from how you continue to surround yourself with, with leadership skills and growth? So as you grow um, and as you grow in a career and as you rise to the top, if you will, is lonely at the top. And, and I'm not saying I'm at the top. Please do not, um, do not mistake what I'm saying. But as you grow in a career and you get to the top, you kind of are by yourself. And it's easy, it's your easy target. You're not just easy target um, for, I want to say, for emotional stability, for loneliness, or I don't have my friend that runs to the lunch room anymore with you because you're working or you're in meetings or you have a new circle of uh, people that are around you, you're, you're at the top, you're by yourself, and it hits hard. It hits harder at the top. When you're amongst everybody at the bottom, you can kind of like, you know, dip and dab a little bit, man, kind of miss the bullets. Can't miss it at the top. So if you mess up at the top, you mess up. So I lean that to say that confidence is uh, something that I, uh, 
I try to focus in a lot on when it comes down to leadership. I remember I, I, I didn't like washing the dishes when I was a kid. I was notorious for, I'm a rambler. I'm a night rambler. I ramble until midnight and fall flat, flat to sleep on my face and up again at 5 o'clock. So I did this my entire life. And what my parents used to do is at 4 o'clock in the morning, they would wake me up and say, Thea, it's time to get up and wash the dishes. And I was just like, are you kidding? <laughs> but they would get me up and do that. What that did is that started to build confidence in me that you are to do this. This is how you clean your, this is how you clean your space. And this is how you do your work. My mother never allowed me to turn in anything with dirty erasure. So what that means, confidence that you're good at your job that you're accurate at your job. Because when you do rise in a career, you do not want, the bullets are, they're harder at the top. They hurt more. I mean, so you want to be good at it. And that's, some of the, that's one of the things I want to say with regards to what I do. When to get to that, you do have to have balance. And what I do is I keep my vision here on my phone nice. that I see that I talk about the promotion. I talk about my spiritual life because that's important to me. It gives me balance. Mm -hmm. It's I talk about my family. My mm -hmm. family is important to me, not just my immediate family, my husband. That's a relationship I want to keep. So you can't have these jobs and lose all of that. What was mean? I don't have children, but I do have, I do have extended family now because I think your, my husband is my immediate family, and my parents became and my siblings became my extended family. But I don't want to lose those relationships. So I do keep what's important in front of me all the time that keeps me balanced and keeps me kind of trugging in the right direction, if you would. Great advice. Very good advice. Christy, I want to ask you this question. If we were turning back the clock 30 years, um, so we did share our, the years we graduated, what would you do differently? Or what do you wish you had known then that you didn't? Uh, I probably wouldn't have been so stressed about it. And, you know, I think uh, I was super serious, as you probably remember. And I thought, you know, <laughs> you have to take a very um, linear path for your career. And mine hasn't been. It has been about opportunity and you take what's in front of you. So I think, um, you know, I would have told myself, like, don't, um, don't worry so much about it. And no one day is ever going to really make or break you. There are very few that, that are really like those pivotal days. And um, I was thinking about, you know, there was a, a day I was, I was early in career and I was working in a law firm. My husband and I used to commute to Washington, D.C. together. And he called me and said, you know what, I've, I've got a stomach bug. I feel really bad. I need to go home. And at the time, I was really focused on, like, billing hours. I don't even know what I was working on. And I'm like, well, Mike, you know, like, I, I need you to take a cab home. And I'll meet you there because I've got to work a full day. And he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and so he gets in the cab. He's heading home. And he calls me from the cab. And he's like, oh, my gosh, I was so sick. I left my keys in my office, and I'm locked out of the house. What do you want me to do? And like a normal person would have been like, oh my gosh, I'll jump in my car, I'll be right there, you poor thing. And I'm like, well, you know, there's a hotel <laughs> next, to, next to the condo where we were living, so why don't you check in there, and then I'll pick you up at the end of the day. And he was like, uh, uh, okay, so I, I did just that. And again, like the perspective, like, what was the, you know it, that wasn't the most important day of my career it's a story that stuck with me and I know you're looking at me like you're all horrified <laughs> but we all have those moments and I think it's really important to just keep it keep it in perspective like it, it is not going to make or break you if you have to leave or take care of something or the, those aren't the days they're they're just very few days that are really Christy, this all is that a pivotal. no judgment zone no <laughs> yeah, judgment zone yeah so so that would be we all have those right well, that would be my advice to to younger self 
Oh, and we're going to open it up in just a moment for, for questions that are from you. So in a moment, I'm going to have our, our incredible panelists um, answer one last question from, from me. But then if there's a question that you've been thinking about or you'd like to ask one of them or to the panel as a whole, over there with Nicole, we've got a mic, so we're going to ask you to just step up and um, go over to the mic so that we can hear your question. But I'm going to close kind of the panel part and just ask rapid fire. I'll start with Alon just and go down. But, um, you know, what is the best career advice you have ever received? I would really say it's, uh, I'm going to go back to something I said earlier. You have to surround yourself with people who believe in you because, you know, when you learn that, it changes everything. And it allows you, again, to tune in. Um, those healthy people around you help you tune in. So, I'm going to say the best career advice is to have people around you. Being a woman and growing up in the time that I've grown up and many of us in this room, we've seen a lot of changes uh, happen. And in the early parts of my career, it, it, you know, you really wanted to get married. That's what we were taught, right? And be at home and be a stay-at-home mom. We were still on the tail end of that. And so to have people who allow you to see your talent, to see your true self and bring that out of you when you are not really there all the way, I, I, it's, it's just critical. And it's no different today. I mean, it's still very tough. We've made a lot of strides. We've gone very far, um, but it's still very tough. So I'm going to say that, that having people around you who really know your heart, really love you, because you can tend sometimes, not these women on this stage, but not achieve your true power and your true abilities. And that's what we're here to do. You know, one of my favorite quotes is by Marianne Williamson. I hope I have it close. Um, and she says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. And so how do you reach that? Each of us, each of us are made to live that potential. Each of us are made to live that light, right? And sometimes you need to have people around you that remind you of that. The world needs us. The world needs us to reach our light, each and every one of us in this room. The world needs you to know what your talents are and to let them shine bright. And so having those people around you that help you get there, real deal, real true, that's what I would say has been the best advice for me. And that was my therapist that helped me with that. <laughs> and you're definitely shining bright. That's beautiful. And I love the authenticity of, of each of these ladies. So um, Thea, tell us yours, please. Uh, but I think the biggest impactful one was for me to be myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I moved to DC, I still had Louisiana dialect. You can hear the Creole draw really bad. And I felt like I was a fish out of water. Mm. And I had a mentor tell me, tell me that I need you to be you. America doesn't need another me. They don't need another. They don't need someone else. They need you to be your authentic self because what you have is unique. What you have is important. And what you have will bring change to the world. Yes. And so that's my biggest thing. Just be who you are. Know who you are, be who you are, enjoy who you are, like who yes, you are. Yes, That's the big thing for me. Awesome advice. Christy, bring us home on this. Uh, so the best advice I've gotten is, is really, at the end of the day, it's about your own core belief. Do you believe you've done the best you can? And that's really all that matters. It's not about the external validation. It's not about your manager telling you, like, you did great on that project. It's really how you feel inside, that's the most important piece. So just making sure that you're in touch with yourself and, and if you feel like you've done all you can, you've done all you can. Uh, so that's been really impactful advice to me and, and really helped me in my career journey. And then I think the, the other best piece of advice is uh, to get a dog <laughs> because <laughs> they will love you unconditionally <laughs> no matter how hard your day is. So uh, and you can walk them and they, you know, just the love that whoever, whatever that is, whether it's your dog or your iguana, I think is, is really important to have that source of, of 
of inspiration every day. I love it. I love it. So don't be bashful. We want to take your questions. We have some <laughs> a little bit more time, and we've specifically carved this out. So um, we're going to take questions, and if not, I'm going to keep firing them because I do have it right here. Would you mind going to the mic so we could hear you just right back there by Nicole? Thank you so much. And while, while you're walking back there, I'll, I'll just share, this reminds me of, you know, we, we all are focused on our why and, and our core beliefs and our vision and our passion. And, and someone said, you know, when you find a place where it's not just a job, it's not a career, but it's your calling. And I heard each of these ladies talk about doing what they love and doing it with passion. Um, as I always say, you know, if you're living out your why, then why not it be you doing it to the best and being the one that does it? So question right here. Yeah. So... Um, first of all, you all are all phenomenal women, and I do appreciate the transparency and the honesty. Um, and clearly, you all have worked in male-dominated fields, or working, um, and have overcome a lot. Because, you know, being a woman is hard, and I work with women all the time who are working in male-dominated spaces, we hear a lot about the challenges. But can you all think back or tell me when being a woman has actually worked to your advantage or how that works to your advantage in what you do? Excellent question. Who wants to take it? Okay, roommate, <laughs> I'll take it. All right. <laughs> I love being a woman, and, you know, and because you're able at this phase, you're able to break barriers. Uh, so that's important. And, uh, and Fela knows, as a woman on business, Government has made um, some provisions over the, uh, really thank our leaders for that, that in their goals on contracts, right? And so they make it an advantage to be minority and woman, right? And so um, that's, that's positive. Uh, and so it's really important that government does things like that because traditionally that has not been the case. Uh, again, I talked about when I worked at Moore, uh, the city was at 3%. And we got that up to 23%. That means that a woman on business, which there are 12 million in the uh, country, can go from our average, the average woman on business is a $100,000 business. That means that that year that I was over that program in Memphis, companies went from doing $100,000 to doing $3 million. So that's huge for a woman to be able to grow her business from 100,000 to $3 million. And, uh, be able to do so that uh, that would be one way of answering that question well said anyone else um, I think in a in a male dominated dominated field and there definitely have been times in my career where I was on, the only woman in the room uh, but I think it's a, a great opportunity to bring your superpowers to the conversation and so for me one of my superpowers is connecting people and connecting this person with this person to build something that's bigger than it would have been otherwise. And I think a lot of that relies on um, my listening to my gut, my own intuition. Um, and so to bring that skill in a way that shows up really differently than if you had a lot of men around the table, kind of that male energy and how they build off of each other and um, has been really helpful and, and helped me not only advance conversations, but also help me show up in a really different way as somebody who's valuable and needs to be in the room because left to their own devices, that connection isn't gonna happen. Well said. I agree. Uh, I was trying to listen to what the two of you all were gonna say about it with trying not to go to the old cliche feminine, uh, the femininity of life, but I think it does bring an added value there where um, there is more of a balance in terms of male energy versus female energy in, ter in terms of getting to those win-win type of uh, arguments, so to say, are, are objectives that are on the table. I think women do bring uh, a more balanced approach um, to, um, to those types of issues. Well said. Yeah. It was interesting. I, I was just recently um, had a, a male leader in my company send me an article um, out of the Harvard Business Review, and it talked about the power of the collaborative style of leadership. And he thanked me for bringing that to our company. And I had never thought about that that was necessarily, you know, my hallmark style. I had never thought about it, that it was a vast deviation from maybe the traditional style. Uh, but it really led to a fascinating, the fact that it came from him to me and that we were encouraging the exchange of ideas and others being heard and 
and everyone feeling inclusive, um, but still getting to swift decisions. So I just thought I'd chime in on that. Another question. Yes, I'd just like to first thank you three ladies for what you do. And, and um, as someone else said, your vulnerability, I can really appreciate that. But I have one question that I, I wonder for the three of you. What would you go back and, and tell yourself as a little girl to comfort any anxiety or woe that you might have had back then? What is it that you would tell her about life now? I would tell the younger Thea that you're going to be resilient because my dad said I could do what I wanted to do. I didn't have to be a teacher. I didn't have to do, I could do what I want to do. You have a brain and you could do it. So, but the one thing I didn't realize is that you're actually resilient. And even though sometimes things hit hard, you bounce back. Um, sometimes my career has not gone the way I want it to go the way I think it should go, and how fast I think it should go. However, each day you become resilient to kind of build on yesterday so that you just move <coughs> a little bit further than what you were before. Well said. Well said. Anyone else want to close on that? I think it's, uh, I tell my younger self, don't sell yourself short. Don't underestimate <coughs> yourself. You know, I think that um, where I am now is nowhere near where I thought when I was growing up. I thought that I'd be a stay-at-home mom, which is wonderful, and I love my, my three daughters, um, and, and that would be the way I was contributing. And, and it's, you know, the adventures and the different experiences I've had along the way, it just, um, I wouldn't have seen that for myself. And um, there have been times I wanted to quit and, and not do what I'm doing, because uh, it's hard. Uh, but but just to keep going and you know you never you never know where one opportunity leads to the next well I think that was a perfect way to close and I'd like to ask everyone here to just stand up and let's give a huge round of applause to these amazing three ladies Boy, what a, what a day. What a day. We, we're bringing this to a close, and we'll have a small token of appreciation for you. And, and just really want to thank you for opening your hearts, giving your time, and sharing and inspiring us all. You know, today um, we are so grateful for uh, Lori Hurwitz and Nicole Bush and all of their teams here at the school that, that put this together. And I know we recognized them earlier, but our Career Services Committee, led by Millie Beth, Curry this year um, is here. If you've been on the committee, would you just please stand because you have worked with the Office of Alumni Relations and the Career Services, and please stand. Joe was here, I know. We had Taruba um, and a couple others, so thank you. I see Joe in the back. Thank you for what you do, um, and again, it's, it's just my supreme honor. Uh, again, I volunteer as the president of Tulane Alumni Association, and I'd be remiss if I did not encourage you all to, to get active in your local clubs. It is such an incredible way to network, to grow, to exchange ideas, to meet other incredible Tulaneums and, and um, people, whether they were through the years you were here, but there's a power in meeting people that were here before you and after you and keeping the synergy of our great institution alive. And then, um, of course, the, the for those that are really looking for more ways to lead, um, we do have nomination opportunities each year for the board and it has been truly for me one of the best gifts um, the past six years of my life and I've just been thrilled to serve you s serve you this year um, and we really we want to see you all stay involved nothing makes Tulane more proud than to see you all become leaders in your respective walks of life and and within your communities and your families and we know it all started at a big pivotal part in all of our journeys right here under the oaks um, and we look forward to hearing more of your stories as we we move forward with women making waves this has been something that it isn't it good to be back together after the pandemic or during the pandemic wherever we are in this um, but isn't it great to be here together because uh, Judge uh, Robin Jeruso was here earlier today and she helped lead this committee during um, COVID and so we were doing it remote and it was very well attended 
Uh, I want to also just um, thank everyone that spoke today, our moderators and our panelists. Let's give it up, a big round of applause. I know in the panels I sat in in our keynote this morning, wow, talk about the power of relationships and so many moving moments. We just cannot thank you enough. Um, and again, you know, please stay involved with the Women Making Waves community on TulaneConnect.com. I know you've got that all bookmarked and you've got it saved on your home screen, but it's an incredible way. And Nicole is always looking for great speakers and women that are willing to mentor and give back. Um, and it's just a great way to connect with Tulaneans throughout the country and now the globe. So we've got a vibrant international program. We were in Mexico this past summer, and that's been very um, important for us to stay connected with our Tulaneans around the globe. And as I bring this to a close, I know you've all been wanting to take home one of those beautiful centerpieces, haven't you? Are those not beautiful? Okay, so I'm not going to forget my last official duty today. And um, why don't we determine whose birthday is closest to today? So when we can say happy birthday and thank you for spending your birthday week, month, day with us. And you will get to take that home. Um, and it may, you know, be a month or two away, but whoever's the closest, we're not going to let you leave without having one moment to connect with the people at your table. And also, in addition to the centerpieces, we are very pleased to offer a limited number of books written by, by Carol Lavin Burnick, our 2017 keynote speaker and the name quest of the beautiful building that we are in. You may pick up a copy on your way out, but that doesn't mean you have to rush to the door, okay? Stay in network for a few minutes. And thank you for being a part and making women making waves so great. And I'm sorry, I forgot. My daughter reminded me. I bought a superpower card for everyone that I oh. wanted to, them to remember us by. So she's going to... Added bonus. You see, the <laughs> gifts keep on going. So thank you. We'll make certain you get that. Everyone have a beautiful, blessed day. And um, thank you for being a part of us. And are we good? All right. Let's give it up for all of you being here. And safe travels.